so we're in nth dimensional space. Uh, we'll stay within nth dimensional space for the next uh, several sections, 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, .3, and then 5.4. We're going to take what we did in 5.1, 5.2, 5.3 and rethink, rethink it for vector spaces in general. Uh, but for now, we're staying in RN. And again, a little summary, we're going to use scalar product. Uh, to study magnitude related directions amongst vectors. So, again, given two vectors, say x, y, we can understand this concept of theta on it. Uh, for magnitude, again, if you wanted to just strictly find the magnitude of one of these vectors, how would you use a scalar product to do that? I keep saying this because we have to have this memorized. We're just going to be using it. So what is it? You just take the scalar product with itself, then take the square root. Uh, the cosine of theta is a number. It's a ratio, which will always be between negative 1 and 1. If we want to find such a ratio, that this tells you the relationship between direction, between cosine and, and, sorry, between x and y. So that relationship between the x and the y is represented by the scalar product tau. You always can make your life easier by making everything unit vectors, and then it's just going to be um, the product. On the other hand, okay, these are the two pieces that talk about the magnitude component and how the directions relate with one another. Uh, from that, we can do work, right? We can actually do some problem solving in general. We could sit there and say, hey, if you have an X and you have a Y, you could calculate a P with a x minus p, make everybody have the appropriate arrows. So that's the x, that's the y, um, this is called the p, this is called the x minus p, I know that those cross at 90 degrees, and this particular component says, hey, uh, I can put all of this magnitude idea, shared direction idea, into find these two parts. I can resolve a vector x into two pieces, a piece that's in the direction of y and a piece that's orthogonal to y. And p is what formula? And this is called the what? Mm. This comes from the what? This here comes from what you said, the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. That's where that comes from. The right-hand side is always going to be between negative 1 and 1, which is what the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality says. Since it's stuck between minus 1 and 1, we'll say that ratio is the cosine of theta. Why? Because it works for two dimensions, it works for three dimensions, let's just call it the cosine of theta for four dimensions on up. That's where the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, you know, that's where we use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. On the other hand, this P is the vector projection of x onto y. X onto y. And obviously we can use this if you're interested in finding this thing. On the other hand, the magnitude of such a thing, what is the magnitude of it? x transpose y divided by the length of y. On the other hand, 
if I would realize that this is a right angle, right, we could have just simply said, hey, by the way, that's the length of x times the cosine of theta, where the cosine of theta is defined up above, right? Because that's just a right triangle. If you want to find out how long the base is, it's cosine times the length of the hypotenuse. And that's that. So what's the name of this? The scalar projection of x onto y. And so when you have problems, I mean, when we look at this, you know, x is not x, y is not y. They're just two vectors, right? If I want the scalar projection of y onto x, you would just simply, or s onto q, or whatever, you just have to realize what the order means. You know, why, don't just memorize this formula, right? If you want to find the vector projection from one vector onto a second vector, so if I would say things like this, so if you had an example and it required you to find the projection of vector d onto vector q. And let's say you're going to call it vector s. What would you write down? What would you need to find? Vector s is going to be what? If I'm going d onto q. It would be d transpose q divided by q transpose q times q, right? What are we doing? We're taking what's the scalar product between the two that tells you essentially their, their combined directionness, dividing by the square of the magnitude of where you're going, and then just simply multiply it by q. And that, this tells you your stretching factor, and it's going to shrink or stretch Q to the appropriate projection. Um, how would I find, so if that was an example, and you just simply plug in numbers. So if this was equal to a bunch of numbers, and that was equal to a bunch, you know, if those two had a vector associated with it, you just plug those numbers in, and you'd get a vector out. Um, on the other hand, how would I find the vector... orthogonal to S. So the, uh, probably the better way, the vector part of D that is orthogonal to S. You know, and we have this whole thing here. Here was D, here was Q, here is S, and I'll, how would I find that guy right there? D minus S. Just D minus S, and you can find that. That's going to be right there. Everybody okay with that? It resolves into those two parts, and they're orthogonal to each other. And you can actually show orthogonality. How could you show orthogonality? S transpose just times D minus S. Right? You would just simply take S transpose times D minus S, and you would get what? Zero. So you could verify that you did it right. You know, a quick check would be, hey, what'd you find? What'd you find? Take their scalar product, I'll get zero. Hey, they're orthogonal. So it doesn't matter what lab labels you do, you just have to understand, you know, that x isn't literally x, it's, it's, it's a representation of a possible vector. Applications of such are, you know, two dimensional space, three dimensional space, whatever. You know, they have all these things where you're taking something from algebra to calculus and trying to interpret it in vector-based idea. You don't have to use vectors, but it does make things go a little bit quicker. When would these be orthogonal? What would have happened? This part here would be what? Zero. zero. And cosine, when is the cosine zero? Pi over two and? Three pi over two and? Pi over 2 plus n pi, right? Plus or minus. And so that's just simply going to be perpendicular. All right, so these are things that, you know, I wrote this down, but you need to be able to use these as your tools as we move on. 5.2 for 
ortho, uh, sorry, orthogonal subspaces and in particular what we're you know we have orthogonal subspaces again we're still in our n but we have a primary goal here um, is to study what's called the fundamental subspaces of Rn. The idea is this. In R2, we have Cartesian coordinates, which are really just simply take E1 and E2, and let's say we get to a place, and we'll call that place, say, V. Normally, this could be called the x-axis. I'm going to use capital X for it. This is the y-axis. I'm going to use capital Y for it. E1 and E2 are obviously, they're orthogonal to each other. Um, the x-axis is actually just simply what? It's the span of E1. The y-axis is actually the span of E2. So when we're talking about Cartesian coordinates of R2, what we really did was have a span of E1 and a span of E2, and I notice that every vector in X is perpendicular to every vector in Y. Right? Eventually we'll call those orthogonal subspaces. But what really happens here is if you wanted to find the coordinates of V and you would go over so many units, say A, and so many units, say B, and you had this point AB. Really what you said is you had A E1s plus B E2s. But A E1 is a vector X that's in X, right? I wrote a Y because I was thinking about the very next thing I was going to say. So that's just a vector in this subspace. And this BE2 is actually some sort of vector that's in the subspace Y. So when you get to this place, what you're really doing is you are taking, say, this vector and this vector resolve to this vector v. So all we're doing is taking what you've done in college algebra, right? You play connected dots, you go count over a, count up b, where are you? Where's the coordinate system? How do you do it? Really what we've done is we've taken vectors in one subspace and another vector in a subspace that happens to be orthogonal to this subspace. And those two together create this place. Now, That idea, if I would go up into Rn, and several sections later, we'll talk about not Rn, but actually any possible vector space. And so if I have Rn space, which I can't even visualize, right? It's just like fifth dimension, sixth dimension, so I'll have a box and I'll call this thing. Well, this is Rn. That's Rn space. What I would like to eventually have is one subspace that obviously if this is a subspace there's one value here that I know it has it definitely has a zero object right and so I'll call this subspace say S better yet I'll just call it X to make it similar to the one up above but I could have another subspace and I'm going to draw it in this way because I know what I would like for these two subspaces to be. And so I have this other subspace, let's call it Y. And then out here I have some sort of vector that exists. Right, and I'll just simply call it, instead of having a line here, I'll call it vector V. So I have this vector represented as a point um, that exists within nth dimensional space. 
and I have these two subspaces, x and y. What I would like to have is that I would like x to be orthogonal to y. I mentioned last class, well, what does that mean? That means every vector in subspace x is orthogonal to every vector in subspace y. And this will happen in a particular way. And so this is what we want. I also want that the vector v is going to be some sort of x plus some sort of y where the x is in x and the y is in y. In other words, there's some sort of vector in x and there's some sort of vector in y. When I add those two, it gets me exactly that vector out. And hopefully uniquely so. So this is kind of our goal type of event. That I can take any higher dimensional space, break up, somehow talk about one subspace and another subspace, just two of them that happen to be orthogonal, and then a piece out of this sub, a vector out of this subspace and a vector out of this uh, subspace will get me to anywhere in my entire space. So I, and I hopefully break it up uniquely. And I want to have both of these be unique. Just like here, in two-dimensional space, there's only, you know, what is, how do you get to this place? A, B. Any other way to do that? No. This is unique. It have a, has a unique representation to be able to get there. So I want all of my space to be essentially broken up into two parts that allows me to then you know, define or discuss anywhere within this entire space. Just two parts. Yep. Would that be considered a span of some sort? I mean, and it is a span. That's how we do it, right? Yeah. In other words, and since this is a subspace, it itself internally has a span. Yeah. This is a subspace, so it itself is a span. And so what am I doing? I'm spanning the entire space using a span of these two Spans. But then you sit there and you look at it, it's like, yeah, that actually works out pretty well. Um, so let's go ahead and define some of those symbols I used. So X and Y are orthogonal subspaces. of Rn, our notation is x orthogonal y, which means orthogonal subspaces, if for all x in x, for all y in y, how do I test for orthogonality? Now, so an example of something like that, say for example, if R3 has a basis, and we'll just simply pick basis E1, E2, E3, right? If I would say x is equal to the span of E1, and if I would pick, so I, and say y is equal to the span of E3, then x is orthogonal to y. It's pretty easy to show because what does any x in x look like? If it's a span of E1, it's what? it'd be something times one zero zero, which is simply a zero zero, right? Any y in y is going to be what? Something times zero zero one, which is really just simply zero zero whatever. And what do I notice? 
what's x transpose y going to be? 0 plus, 0 plus, 0, which is 0. Everybody okay with that? So any x, any y are orthogonal. <coughs> so hence x is orthogonal to y. Because really what did I do? I took a times 0 is 0, 0 times 0 is 0, 0 times b is 0. If I wanted to write that, I might have been a times 0, 0 times 0, 0 times b, that's 0. Now, a lot of times uh, we're given one particular span, one particular, sorry, one particular subspace. And I would like to say, hey, now that you've been given this subspace, could you just go ahead and collect every vector that's orthogonal to it and put it in another subspace? And say, you know, every one. For example, um, this, this y doesn't collect everything that's orthogonal to x because there's one vector I didn't use. I didn't use E2, right? So what I actually showed was the x-axis and the z-axis are orthogonal. But the y-axis is also orthogonal, right? So if you're just given the x-axis, who's all orthogonal to the x-axis? Anything in the direction, strictly in the direction of z, anything strictly within the direction of y, or anything within the direction of only use x and y axis coordinates, which is a plane. So if I collect all of those together, that's called, it's orthogonal, but it's going to be called the orthogonal complement. Right? What's the idea of a complement? Well, if you think about logic, what's the complement of true? False. False. Right? What's the complement of an even number? Odd. So a lot of times we think of complements as just being one, there's only one complement. But there's other types of complements. What's, what's the complement of being divisible by three? Not being divisible. Not being divisible by three, but there's, that means when I divide by three, to be divisible by three means when you divide by three, you get how much left over? Zero. Zero. What's not that? Five. Your leftovers are one or two. two. So when I divide the number by 3, I either have a remainder of 1 or a remainder of 2. Right? So I actually have two groups, remainders of 1, remainders of 2, if I look for not divisible by 3. If I say not divisible by 4, I'm talking about remainders of 1, 2, or 3. Now I have three groups that are associated with this. And so when I'm talking about this idea of, hey, who's all orthogonal to the direction of E1? Well, E2 is orthogonal to E1. E3 is orthogonal to E1. And any combination of E2 and E3 is going to be orthogonal to E1. And so that idea forms what's called the orthogonal complement. So Y is a subspace of Rn, then the set of all x in Rn such that x transpose y equals 0 for all y in y is called y's orthogonal complement. Notation is, all right. For the notation, a lot of times you read different books and they'll pick different notations. It's like one of those things. Uh, uh, what's the notation, what's the logical not notation? Anybody know that one? There's usually two representations of it. They're either tilde or that little bar thing. Or how do you sometimes complement things otherwise? Like in binary, like in Boolean, you put a little hat on it, right? We tend to put little symbols to associate not that. I want everything that's not that, right? We're going to use an upper hat type of symbol, but we're going to move it over to the side. 
Uh, what's the symbol that you use for orthogonality? That upside down T, which is really an, an upside down T, it's a right angle, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say Y, because it's obviously the orthogonal complement of Y. We're not going to give him a hat. We're not going to put a knot. We're going to put an upside down T right there. To say, what am I doing? Find every vector that is orthogonal to every vector in here. And again, this re is represented as every X that's in Rn, such that x transpose y is 0 for all y and y. So example back into, again, R3. If x is equal to the span of only using the x-axis, obviously x is orthogonal to the span of E2. X is orthogonal to the span of E3. But on the other hand, X's orthogonal complement is going to be the span of E2 and E3 put together. Right? Because X is still orthogonal to this span. Right? but I only call this span the orthogonal complement because it's everything that's orthogonal to E1. So what I, what I do in three space is you can imagine this. This room's three space, right? And let's say I do right-hand system. That would mean that the origin is here at the door. The x-axis is going along the door's wall the y-axis is going along this board, and the z-axis is going up, right? So if I say I want every vector along x, this, everything in this direction, right? Now remember, here, here, comes, here comes this kind of a visualiz visualization point. Um, probably an easy way to think about this, if you ever see, there's a, uh, a movie from like 2002, yeah, around 2000 or so, Jet Li, called Hero. And one of the things they have this thing, and they have this, they have these archer events, and they shoot a million arrows, and you see this giant wall, and they hit stuff, and it looks like a big giant pin cushion, right? But they're all going in the same direction. So imagine this: when I'm talking about the span in the x direction, what I'm talking about is this wall here of nothing but arrows coming towards you, right? We might represent it as a single vector, an axis. But that represents a direction without location, right? It's all of these vectors that go that way, okay? Now, the orthogonal complement to all of those arrows that are coming out of this wall and towards you is the YZ span. What is the YZ span? Well, this is Y going along the board, and Z is going upwards. What's the YZ span? This entire plane what is that? That's arrows on this, on this plane that simply go like this, right? So what is the orthogonal complement to all of these arrows going like that? Imagine a tube of arrows that are coming out and they're all going away from this direction. An arrow that goes in the middle of the room, it's going like that, is obviously orthogonal to an arrow going that way. And then how do I get to any particular place? Well, I can start at the origin and pick an arrow that goes like this and an arrow that goes like that, and I'll get there. And so those are the orthogonal complements. Is everybody okay with that? And if I would miss, like for example, if you remove the z-axis, you can't get it, you can't, that's not everybody. Arrows that move from the front of the room to the back are obviously orthogonal from all the arrows that move from this wall on the right, on your left, across the room. They're all orthogonal. That would be this span, right? But if I would only do E3, all the arrows going from the back, sorry, the front to the back are orthogonal, those from coming the floor to the ceiling. They're orthogonal. But if I put together left to right in floor to ceiling I would have these arrows that would actually be kind of like emitting outwards 
from that z-axis. That includes those, these arrows and these arrows, but it also would include those arrows, where they're all orthogonal to these arrows that are what? Imagine it coming right at you. Is everybody okay with that? All right. It's important to think about vectors as, as this free thing. I mean, this is, you start to imagine like flow of water. That you have these arrows and the water is flowing and behaving differently at particular times, causing a vortex, and which means the arrows will start to turn on themselves. And so that's the study that we do on these sort of vectoral objects. Okay. Um, note. A vector space intersecting its orthogonal complement is always going to be what? All a sub sorry a subspace. A subspace always includes at least what? The zero. The zero objects. Its orthogonal complement must include the zero. zero objects. So what's the only thing that both of them share? Zero. They both have to share the zero object because they're subspaces. All right. This one? Uh, the arc. Oh, that's intersect. That's uh, a uh, bridge. Um, and if I would do, say, for example, a cup B, that's called union, which is to put the two together. So this, the intersect is actually the word and. The union is the word or. It's in this or this. It's in this and this. Eventually what we're going to have is we're going to be interested in an intersection. That's The orthogonal complements are empty, but their union is the entire space. In other words, if I put the vectors together, I actually get everywhere. Finally, uh, we're going to ask... We're going to consider, so now, consider a and n, sorry, an m by n matrix. Multiplying things by a are a linear operator, right? So this is a linear operator. Um, multiplying something by A where is, this is Rn this is Rm if I would take this this is um, A times an X is equal to Y so there's an X on this side there is some sort of Y on this side. Since this is m by n, x is n by 1, y is m by 1. So I would look at this and say, hey, you know, a is going to take x's and it could take all the x's and they're, they're going to spit out y's. And so a is obviously, when I look at this, we have, we're studying ax as a linear operator where this A is taking nth dimensional space and spitting out nth dimensional space and it satisfies we already have done this before it's a linear operator now on the other hand if I would take A which is M by N and transpose it A transpose since it's M by N a transpose is what size? It would flip it. So A transpose, if I would look at this and say, hey, A is an M by N matrix, but that means A transpose is what? N by M. What does an N by M matrix do when it multiplies stuff? It moves nth dimensional space to nth dimensional space. 
So I could imagine, and it's still a matrix, right? So it's still a linear operator. So A is a linear operator that takes size N on the left and spits out size M on the right. A transpose does what? Goes backwards. It takes size that on the left and spits out size that on the right. Now, if this was square, you know, type of thing, it's like when I look at it, it's like these are not, these are, if I look at this, I might as well call this a, let's call him Y prime and let's call this one X prime, right? It does not move the same stuff to the same stuff. This is not invertible, right? If I would leave it as the same X and the same Y, you could imagine, oh, it's taking this X to that Y and A transpose takes that Y to that X. No, it doesn't. It's just taking anything on the right and spits out something on the left. I don't know what it's doing, but I can imagine that this thing is, this thing is a linear operator of some sort. Sure would be nice if the way you found inverses would be just to transpose it, but it's not. These are two completely different linear operators. I'm just choosing, we're writing it this way. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Um, given that I have that A, what's going to happen is that A and A transpose are going to break Rn, Rm into fundamental subspaces. And we'll, de we'll define what a fundamental subspace is here in a bit. So here is Rn, here is Rm. I could imagine the linear transform A. I could imagine the linear transform A transpose. And what's going to happen is there is a subspace here and another subspace here with a subspace over here and another subspace, say, here. where the zero object of Rn is here, the zero object of Rm is here, and these two subspaces are going to be orthogonal complements. These two subspaces are going to be orthogonal complements. And what, what it ends up being is one of these subspaces here is going to be, this subspace is going to be the null space of A. And this subspace is going to be the null space of A transpose. What's the null space of A? What's the null space represent? It's every vector on the left that when it gets multiplied by A goes where? So if I would write this say in red, this is the null space of A goes where? Right there. What would be the null space of A transpose? Every vector on this side when I multiplied by A transpose spits out what? That zero object. So the null spaces, all right, these are just linear operators. Linear operators we can find the null space of, right? So take A, find its null space. We know how to do that. It ends up being that this guy is going to be the null space of A's orthogonal complement, and this guy is going to be the null spaces of A transpose orthogonal complement, which means collect everybody who's, not in, who's orthogonal to the null space of A. Please collect everybody who is orthogonal to the null space of A transpose. It will end up being that 
that theorem. This is called the fundamental subspaces theorem is for A M by N is 1. The null space of A's orthogonal complement is the range of A transpose. And the null space of A transpose orthogonal complement is the range of A, where R of A is range of A. And R A transpose is range of A transpose. But make the range is really the what? what? What other word did I use for the range? The column space. We'll get to this point. And so what happens is, if we would look at that, is the null space of A is everybody on the left who gets mapped to the zero object on the right. Who is orthogonal to that? If I look at this, the orthogonal complement of that is, hey, what's the column space of A transpose? Well, here comes the fun part. The column space of A transpose, right? what is A transpose? A transpose flipped the rows and columns. So the column space of A transpose is actually the row space of A written as columns. And we'll show that that's actually true, that, that these are orthogonal complements. So it ends up being that the row space of A written as columns is, the, is this guy right here. That's the row space of A written as columns. And this guy right here is the row space of A transpose written as columns. In other words, why are they called the fundamental subspaces? Because these subspaces are generated by the linear transform of A. Every matrix A will take the space and break it up into orthogonal complements. The null space and the row space written as columns are orthogonal complements of one another. And what will happen here is kind of a nice little feature um, that means that every vector on this side can be broken up into two pieces. A piece from the null space of A transpose and a piece of the its orthogonal complement. Which happens to be what? The range of A. <laughs> which tells us that every vector has a part that A could have mapped to, which is the range of A in a part that's in the null space of A transpose. And we'll use that to actually solve problems that up to this point were, hey, I have an overdetermined system that has no solution. We're going to use this fact that this breaks it up into two parts to actually solve it. Not solve it, but come up with an analog solution. All right, where does all this stuff come from? How do I get to that theorem? No. I mean, because really what happens is this actually has, since orthogonal complements are orthogonal complements, if you wanted to, you could actually combine with this other ones. You could say, hey, I was right this way, say 1A, that the null space of A is the range of A transpose's orthogonal complement, and 2A is the null space of A transpose is simply the range of A's orthogonal complement. Because they're orthogonal complements of each other. All right, uh, we need some, if I'm going to be able to show that, we need to remember some stuff. So first off, null space. The null space of A is what? All X's that are in Rn such that AX spits out the zero object of the right, which is the mth dimensional space. 
On the other hand, the null space of a transpose is, hey, what are all things that exist in mth dimensional space such that a transpose times that spits out the zero object of nth dimensional space? And our new notation, range, the range of A is simply, hey, who's all on the right such that that thing can be found by a multiplication for some x in the left. And the range of A transpose is, is there all the x's on the left hand side such that that x could have been found by a transpose y for some y on the right. Again, what we're talking about is please collect what's the null space? Take everybody in nth dimensional space so that a times it goes zero. What's the null space of A transpose? Take everybody in mth dimensional space so that A transpose times it is zero object of the left-hand side. And one of the things we can note about the ranges, note, the range of A is just the column space of A and the range of A transpose is just the column space of A transpose. It's just a notational difference. I can use the same words. Because what is it? Really, the, col the range of A is a linear combination of A's columns spits out a thing, which means this thing has a solution, which means it's in the column space. And also, the column space of a transpose, which is what? We switch row A, column A. The column space of A transpose, since A transpose is switching rows and columns, that's actually a space of the rows of A written as columns. Does that make sense? So this is simply the row space of A written as columns. And the column space of A is simply the row space of a transpose written as columns so that means we have three ways of talking about the range <laughs> so putting those three things together The range of A is column space of A is row space of A transpose as columns. On the other hand, the range of A transpose is the column space of A transpose is row space of A as columns. That's the psychological connection I want us to grab. That the range of A is actually the column space of A. But if you wanted to find it, you could actually take A transpose, reduce it, and figure out the row space of A transpose, and then write it as a column. So um, the range of A transpose, if you wanted to find it, you would take A transpose, figure out its column space. But how could you do that? 
just take A, reduce it, figure out its row space, and then write it as a column. And then you would have solved the same thing. So in other words, because of this connection, we really don't have to switch A and A transpose and deal with it as, as two completely separate problems. We can take one and figure out column space and row space and figure out the other one by this, this three ways of saying the same thing. All right. All of that fun stuff. Now, what am I looking for? I'm looking for the null space, right? This is the homogeneous system of equations. Solving it gives you the null space. Written out, what does this thing look like if I would write it as column, as an actual system of equations? What does this look like? This is x1 times a11 plus x2 times a12 plus xn times a1n is supposed to be equal to 0. So as a system of equations, this was just simply x1 a21 plus x2 a22 plus everything up to xn a2n is supposed to be 0 x1 a m1 plus x2 a m2 plus everything up to x n a m n is supposed to be zero. As a system of equations, that's what this problem looked like. sit there and wonder um, why would that be important. Does that look familiar? The first row looks like a scalar product. So the first row looks like a scalar product, but it's a scalar product between what and what? x1, x2, xn is what? x. So this thing here is, it's the scalar product of x and a's what? Not first column, first row, right? And a's first row. By the way, A's first row would be A transposes what? First column. So what did I find? This first line says A transposes first column. Well, if a scalar product equals zero, what does that tell you about those two? They're orthogonal. Hey, X... Where's x from? Right? It's from Rn, and it's out of what? The solution set of Ax equals 0, which is the null space. So this happens when what? A vector out of the null space is orthogonal to A transpose's first column. What would be the very next equation tell you? It must also be orthogonal to... A transposes second column. What's the third equation going to tell you? It's orthogonal to A transposes third column. And so what do I find? All X's that are orthogonal to all of A transposes columns, which is A's rows. Now, because our scalar product 
is 0, we see x is orthogonal to each of a's rows, which is what? So that's really each of a transpose's columns. If every x is orthogonal to every a transpose column, that means that they are orthogonal complements. Hence, the null space of A is orthogonal to the column space of A transpose, which is really what? If I say the column space of A transpose, what other things should I think? It's the range of A transpose. It's also thought of as the row space of A written as columns. Right? Whenever you see that, you need to think of those three things at the same time. And the null space of A orthogonal column is the column space, which would be so the range of A transpose. And you could write it on either side. <coughs> I said transpose today. <laughs> uh, all right. So our theorem actually follows from just that. It's just simply, what does null space of A represent? That system of equations. You just look at the system of equations and says, oh, wait a second. That literally just simply says that the column space of A transpose and X is all, every X is in the null space are orthogonal to each other. All of those and all of those, they're orthogonal complements of one another. So it actually collected all. All right. So another theorem Okay, again, I'll just rewrite the fundamental subspaces The whole point here is that the null space of A's orthogonal complement is simply the range of A transpose or the null space of A is the range of A transpose's orthogonal complement and the null space of A transpose orthogonal complement is the range of A, or you could just simply say that the null space of A transpose is equal to the range of A's orthogonal complement. However you choose. Now, every one of those, you're just trying to think about that they're all orthogonal to each other. And next theorem. S is a subspace of Rn. Rn has basis, say x1, x2, up to how many vectors are necessary for a basis of Rn? Needs n of them. If the basis of S is x1, x2, up to xr, in other words, what we're saying is that the dimension of S is equal to r, then the dimension of S's orthogonal complement is going to be n minus r, which is going to be the other basis, in other words, the basis of S, S's orthogonal complement is X of R plus 1 all the way up to Xn. In other words, if you take, what this allows us to do is say, if you take a basis for the entire space, take some of those vectors for a span, its orthogonal complement, which is what we just showed, which I used at the beginning, if I took only the x-axis, the orthogonal complement is going to be the y and the z, just the others. And so what this allows us to do is to take a basis and break it up into two parts and use 
some vectors for one, the other vectors will go into the orthogonal complement, and it also allows us to say that the dimension of S plus the dimension of S's orthogonal complement must be the dimension of the space. All right. A little further along, and then we'll finally be able to solve things that before we just simply said no solution. Basis of the uh, s diagonal complement. Yep. Um, what's in the, uh, the color braces after that? This? Yeah. X, X, R plus 1 up to Xn. So if oh, the basis okay. of 1 is everything to N, okay. if you get take 1 to R for one subspace, its orthogonal complement is the others. Okay. okay. It's not the best way of writing it notation wise. You normally want to use the subtraction, but. <laughs> 